Very good evening to you and welcome to BCC. Uh, this is our second service whose specific focus is national transformation. One of the scriptures in the Bible says, Be ye transformed by the renewal of your mind. And it's interesting because we like to transform other people, but hardly ourselves. So as we begin the service, our plea to you is be ye transformed by the renewal only of your mind first and then the change around you will begin. A reminder too, ladies and gentlemen, that as we begin, um, giving is still the order uh, of the day and we encourage you in whatever way you can to continue contributing to your church. We've also witnessed in recent times the resurgence of the coronavirus or COVID-19 and we encourage you to remain focused on protecting yourselves and those around you. ...yourself from coronavirus. It can kill you. There are several methods you can adopt to protect yourself and others from getting the deadly coronavirus. Frequently clean your hands by using an alcohol-based product or soap and water, especially after coughing or sneezing, when caring for the sick, after visiting the toilet, before, during and after the preparation of food, and after handling animals or animal waste. When coughing and sneezing, cover your mouth with a flexed elbow or tissue. If you use tissue, discard it immediately into a closed bin. Avoid the consumption of raw or undercooked meat. Avoid close contact with anyone that has a fever and cough. And if you have fever, cough and difficulty breathing, seek medical care early and share information about any recent travels with your healthcare provider.
Greetings. My name is Pastor Kumbukani Piri, and I'm glad to be back with you with Dr. Shingi Munyeza. And uh, we are looking at the Davidic kingdom, and we're speaking into national issues. We're looking at how the kingdom of God is indeed applicable, not just at an individual level, not just at a family community level, but indeed it speaks into the issue of nation building. Dr. Munyeza, welcome. We're so excited. Thank you so much for the journey you're taking us on. This is a huge journey, sir. And thank you for your courage and your commitment to declaring God's kingdom into national issues. Thank you very much, uh, Pastor Kumbu Piri. And uh, greetings to you all. And I hope I find you well. Uh, it's a bit chilly. Um, uh, the weathers have been down and we have to be uh, COVID compliant. We have to uh, at least make sure that we are social distancing, hygiene factors and stay away from, um, from exposing yourself and one another to, um, to, to the pandemic. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a terrible out there. Uh, but back to where we should be. Um, I'd like to just say that we're talking about the citizen that God wants. And uh, we've been talking about the transition between Saul's kingdom and David's kingdom or the kingship of Saul in the kingship of David. Um, and we see how certain values are being molded in that transition. And the reason I say that is that Zimbabwe is also going through that similar transition. After 40 years, uh, God in his own wisdom uh, doesn't look at 40 years as a no more just 40 years. Things happen. There is kairos moments that happen at 40 years where 40 years is a completion of trial of a process and then you're launched into another season where you go through a different uh, um, blessing, uh, different dispensation. Um, for example, in the past 40 years, uh, we have experienced uh, some real, um, uh, you know, sweet and sour moments. Mm -hmm. Sweet moments is that we got our political independence. The sour moments have been that uh, there's been definitely no uh, real um, benefit or real transformation that has happened to, to us as a people. And the issue is that perhaps it is because of the value system. And we've been talking about the value system we adopted at independence, which uh, formed the citizen that we became. Of course, that citizen <clears throat> was led by a leadership that um, had a certain value proposition. And, and in my conviction, I, I believe so that the founding values were found in the occult system. Um, and they were fractured, they were faulty, and uh, they, they, were, they lacked posterity. So uh, we are where we are because the value system that we prescribe to as a nation are not godly. Uh, they are very consumptive. They are, they are evil in, in, in nature, some of them. Um, they are very selfish. Um, they, they have no posterity um, in, in nature. Yet the godly value system, which we talk about, the godly altar, they, they are o the exact opposite of where we are. <clears throat> so who, divine, who defines these values? And we've been talking about uh, the example of David and Saul. Uh, and we are now at David. Last time we were talking about the transition when Saul dies and then uh, David has to take over. And we left off uh, where it was easy for David to, um, to celebrate the death of Saul. But that would have been a wrong value system for David. Because later on, you must understand that the, David was carrying the Christ nature. He is a type of Christ in the Old Testament. So when, when, when the New Testament uh, uh, unveils and the, the Christ appears on the scene, even the blind people would refer to Christ and say, O oh, Jesus, son of David. Now, so David had to be the reference point for posterity. Now, when you found a nation such as Zimbabwe, 
we, we had to have certain value system that the carriers of those value system would have been referred to them. Just like blind man Bartimaeus and the rest of them would be saying, yes, this is the son of David. He didn't say this is the son of Solomon. He says this is the son of David. But they were referencing to a Davidic moment of kingship, of, uh, of the values, the man that was after God's heart. So David couldn't afford to have been the part of the process to eliminate Saul. Because he knew one thing in his heart, that it was God's way, uh, God's order to deal with Saul. Because he'd already been anointed. So as far as his own personal security was concerned, he didn't need to prove a point to Saul. Twice, though, David would have taken out Saul. Twice. That's right. He would have taken out Saul, but he didn't. Again, earlier on, he didn't. Because he was busy setting up a value system for the nation of Israel. And, uh, and you find him uh, now that people have told him that your enemy Saul is dead. But David says, he, he's not. But he moans for Saul. He moans for Jonathan, his friend. What a man. So, so when, when we look at our Zimbabwean situation, there is a tendency, Pastor Kumbu, that if your enemy is maimed, killed, or incarcerated, there is a rejoicing. So we always... Uh, swing the pendulum from one extreme to uh, the other extreme. So we never come to a place where we embrace each other with our diversities as Zimbabweans. We tend to always see each other as enemies. We have a binary formation where there's us and them. Team A, like I was saying last time, and Team B. And the two, even though they are Zimbabweans, are not supposed to meet. So in a sense, this Davidic uh, mindset, the enemy is not the group, but it's the, the enemy is that which destroys nationhood. Yes. This, this Davidic mindset it looks at the end goal being a discipled or a transformed Zimbabwe. So is that the gap? The, the gap? That is the gap. We have not defined the... <laughs> the common values to, 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 to bring us together. But uh, we also have not defined the essentials, the common essentials between us. Let's say you are team A and I'm team B. But we have not defined between team A and team B to say what are the essentials. But in those, therein must come out who the enemies are and who our friends are. Now, what has happened is that because we have not defined, uh, even if I have friends, they just become your enemies. If I have enemies, they just become your enemies. And we don't agree on who is our friends, who is our enemies, who is for us, and who is against us. So now, let's go back to David. So in chapter, um, uh, we've just been reading you now, in chapter 29, um, 1 Samuel chapter 29. The Philistines, this is the penultimate war. They're preparing. And I call it the penultimate war because this is the final battle they're going to have to where Saul dies. So the Philistines prepare to go to battle. Remember that David is in Ziklag and he is kind of made a peace treaty with the Philistines at that time. Peace treaty with it, to the point that the Philistines had almost adopted David and his uh, uh, destitute, in debt and in distress kind of people who he had trained up now to become quite good uh, and adept soldiers. He... he they, they had actually understood, said, David is one of us. So the Philistines are, are preparing to go and fight the Israelites. Now, take, let's, let's walk through this very clear. Because this is part of our transitional problem right now as Zimbabweans. 
because we're failing to identify who is our common enemy and who is our common ally and friend. David had the same problem. So David said, you want to fight Saul, you want to fight the Israelites. I can be part of that war. I would love to fight Saul and prove to him the kind of army that I am and that I'm fighting on your side. So, because Saul, in some way, had become David's enemy, and the Philistines had also had Saul as David's enemy. So there was an agreement between the two of them in that logical thinking. But it did not align to a spiritual dimension that God had ordained. So David wanted to have an ally in the Philistines who were perpetual eternal enemies of the Israelites. At that moment, David had lapsed. He had lapsed. He had lapsed. He should have understood that the Philistines will never be our friends, not if they are fighting David, uh, uh, Saul, not if they are fighting the children of Israel. They are not supposed to be my allies to fight them. I can have some kind of understanding so that I'm not fighting them and there's no war. But we will never pick up a fight to fight the house of Israel. But he did. He approached them. The princess came in chapter 29 of 1 Samuel. And, and, and Akish was there. And he, and he said, look, we would like to do this. He was pleading with them. Now, you've got to read. Let's, let's actually read um, uh, when he had actually um, told the king. And the king is saying uh, in, in verse 4, it says, but the princess of the Philistines were angry with him. So the princess of the Philistines said to him, make this fellow return. The Philistines are saying, we don't want David. The reason is, he might turn against us. But you've got to see it as a divine intervention. You've got to see that as a divine intervention. So certain allies, you are repelled in a, in a kairos moment uh, because God wants you to be on the right side of history so that you'll be able to push a godly agenda. Now, in a transition, one has to be very careful which side you're getting your side on. So there is still team A and team B. So let's talk about that. Now, in the building of nations, in the building of kingdoms, in the building of, uh, uh, of, um, of posterity, we've got to realize which side of posterity you want to be. The victor side or the villain side. Now, David had chosen the wrong place to be. But God had to intervene to rescue David because he's the king of Israel. He has forgotten all that, that he's the king of Israel, yet he's now siding with the enemy, who's the Philistines, to eliminate the king of Israel or to defeat the nation of Israel. Now, let's just follow through that logic. If David and the Philistines had won, who was going to be in charge of Israel? It was never going to be David. It was going to be the Philistines. God comes through. He makes the Philistines not accept David's offer. It was David's offer, by the way. It wasn't even the Philistines who were saying, David, come and help us. It was David's offer. So here we go. So it says, and they are furious about that offer. <laughs> they are actually furious. And God intervenes. That is a godly intervention and divine intervention. Um, and he says, lest in the battle he become our adversary. For with what could he reconcile himself to, to his master, if not with the heads of these men? Is this not David, of whom they sang to one another in dances, saying, Saul has slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands? Then Achish called David and said to him, Surely, as the Lord lives, you have been upright. And you're going out and you're coming in with me in the army is good in my sight. Now, David had actually helped Achish in a few wars. 
<laughs> in a few battles. He says, you've been faithful to me. And I've loved what to see. But here's what he says. For to this day, I've not found evil in you since the day of your coming to me. Nevertheless, the lords do not favor you. Therefore, return now and go in peace that you may not displease the lords of the Philistines. Now, David is turned away on an offer to fight on behalf of the Philistines to fight the nation of Israel. And he was anointed as king. So there's a sense in which, you know, this, I look at Zimbabwe, Dr. Mnizo, we've been in this political crisis, quote unquote, for a long time. It's easy to then lose perspective and become like David, where you, you forget actually that ultimately God wants to restore Israel. And maybe that's why maybe we, we don't really know who the real enemy is, because we've become lost in the multiple agendas, you know, to help us. Because I think ultimately God, vin God pulls David back and returns him back to the ultimate vision, which is a, a nation. A and nation of Israel. Not a group. Not an individual either. See, what we tend to do is that we hate a whole nation because of an individual. We hate a whole uh, um, a Zimbabwean sector because of an individual. So we, we brush everything and everyone with the same brush and now we've created a cluster of enemies who are not supposed to be your enemies. Now, whether David was overreacting of his issue with Saul, but he forgot that there is a nation of Israel at this point. And God had to come through Achish and the lords of the Philistines say, no, we're not taking on David to be on our side. And I don't think, in my view, that David was going to be in battle, change his mind and say, we're going to fight the Philistines. Remember, he'd already been helping them in battles. So he wasn't. He was actually going to defeat and destroy Israel. Kill his own kinsmen. Because David was a mighty warrior. Commander of all sorts. Killed a lion and a bear. Bear ends. That guy was unbelievable in battle. That's why the women, and oh, it's always, by the way, it's always the women that come in to, to really rejoice. When they, and the, 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 we have that situation. Guess who puts on the party regalia? It's always the women and they are forever singing and dancing. And not to say anything about our women, but we've got to stop that abuse of our women. Because it's an abuse. It's a misogyny of, our, uh, of, 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 of the highest order. That women are always in politicking, are abused in politicking. And the men just sit there and the women just start singing. There's no man who sang for David here. So that you find even in this narrative. So, so David said to Achish, that's verse 8, and so David said to Achish, but what have I done? And to this day, what have you found in your servant as long as I have been with you, that I may not go and fight against the enemies of my Lord, the king? This is David. This is, uh, uh, this is repugnant. This is, this, is, this is the worst that can come out to the future king of Israel. An anointed king of Israel. He is upset. He says, look, what have I done? Can I fight the, the king's enemy? And who is the king's enemy? The nation he was supposed to be king over. This is the 11th hour. This is the 11th hour. Now, this is transition time. Now, I might be speaking in, 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 in spiritual language, but it also must mirror what is going on in Zimbabwe. We need to identify who our common enemy is. We need to identify who our common allies are. Now, in the nation of Israel, the common enemy was always going to be the Philistines. Now, he's, but David lapsed. Now, he says, then Akish answered and said to David, I know that you are as good in my sight as the angel of God. Nevertheless, the princes of the Philistines have said, he shall not go up with you, uh, with us to battle. Now, therefore, rise early in the morning with your master's servants who have come with you. And as soon as you are up early in the morning and have, have light, depart. So David and his men rose early to depart in the morning to return to the land of the Philistines and the Philistines went up to Jezreel. Now, <laughs> this is now when you go to chapter 30. Because David was psyched up for war. 
It appears, now I'm going to dramatize this, because that's the beauty about scripture and how God speaks to us. You, you have to dramatize to illustrate the point. David is, is psyched up. His men were ready for war. And whilst he was doing this, guess who comes to invade his camp? The Amalekites. Says now, verse chapter 30, says, Now it happened when David and his men came to Ziklag. On the third day that the Amalekites had invaded south, the south and Ziklag, attacked Ziklag and burnt it with fire. Whilst they were trying to fight a war that wasn't theirs, which was fighting their own kinsmen, they opened an opportunity for the Amalekites. This is the 11th hour. I want you to listen. There is a prophetic message here. This is the 11th hour. God allows the Amalekites to come in and invade the camp of David whilst he's away. Where was he going to? Going to fight a war <laughs> or going to plead to fight a war that wasn't his. And meantime, the real enemy comes <laughs> when he had thought the enemy is the Israelites to fight alongside the Philistines. The real enemy this time is the Amalekites who come in and burn the whole place, take the women and children and the plant that was with them, and they escape. So they get there. They realize, ah, oh, we actually have a war on our hands. The real enemy is the Amalekites, not the Israelites, which he had determined, and uh, comes back now, he has got to fight the, uh, the Amalekites. Now, he, he is the turning point. He is where the repentance is. Now, when he went to side up with the Philistines, he didn't inquire of the Lord. He just went. Because he used his skill, he found that that was the best thing to do. He needed to fix and to humiliate Saul. In battle, he said, yeah, you see who I'm fighting against, I'm going to get you. I'm going to get you. You wanted to kill me, you wanted to kill these guys here, I'm going to get you. But he was destroying the nation of Israel if he had gone into that battle. But guess, guess what happens? God creates this. And when that happens, here is what David said. So let's read through. Verse 3 says, So David and his men came to the city, and there it was, burnt with fire. And their wives, their sons, and their daughters had been taken captives. Then David and the people who were with him lifted up their voices and wept until they had no more power to weep. And David's two wives, Ahunam and Jezreelites, and the Abigail, the widow of Nabal, and the, the, the Camelite, <coughs> had been taken captive. Now his wife, his children had also been taken. Now David was greatly distressed for the people spoke of stoning him because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and his daughters. But David strengthened himself in the Lord, his God. Then David said to Abiathar the priest, Ahimelech's son, please bring the effort here to me. And Abiathar brought the effort to David. So David inquired of the Lord saying, shall I pursue this troop or shall I overtake them? Now, why didn't David do the same thing when he went to side with the Philistines? Why didn't he ask the Lord and say, Lord, should I be on the Philistines' side to fight the Israelites or not? But this time he was hit where it hurts most. Wife and children gone. Now he is forced to inquire of the Lord. Now, he's got to do this delicately because if he didn't do that... Now, we've got to understand, transition have a way of revealing our personal agenda, mm. our motives, our values. Because it's a delicate, vulnerable time. Like giving birth, it's a transition time. Like moving jobs, it's a transition time. Moving homes, it's a transition. These are vulnerable moments. So David realizes, uh-oh, I now have 
my wife and ch my wives and children gone. I can't play uh, gambling on this anymore. He comes back to his senses and says, the only place I can never gamble with is to inquire of the Lord. But he did gambled to destroy the children of Israel. But this time he says, no, I won't gamble this. I am going to inquire of the Lord. So he inquires of the Lord and he says, <laughs> I, I wish he could just, you know, the prayer today for any Christian is always, Lord, please, uh, uh, can you send back my family? They don't do anything, you know. The, 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 the prayers of, of saints today, Pastor Kumbu, is sometimes quite discouraging. They want the Lord to be um, their feet and hands. So they don't realize that God is not going to come here physically. He's going to use you and me. So they never put themselves in the equation of saying, what do you want me to do, Lord? I listen to a lot of prayers of, of saints and of Christians and praying about our situation in Zimbabwe. Lord, come and solve our problem. God is not going to come and solve our problem, but God is going to speak to you and me to take our part in resolving the current crisis in Zimbabwe. So this Davidic mindset gets us to a place where we fight God's battles. Dr. Mnizza, I think for many of us at multiple levels, we are fighting battles and the ability to locate the Lord's battles you know, I'm reminded, is it in Joshua where the Lord says, I don't take sides. You know, the army of mm. the command of the Lord. Yes. Because he's calling us to come onto his side. And mm. that's what da David was now on the Lord's side. Yes. This time, because now he has inquired of the Lord. I mean, can you think, if three days earlier he was worried about fighting the, Philist uh, the, the Israelites on the Philistine side, and then three days later, he now has a personal problem. And the people want to stone him for having what? You asked us to go and be on the side of the Philistines. We left our women and children exposed to the Amalekites, and now we don't have them. Now, you could also find out one thing about the Amalekites. The Amalekites had stopped um, Israel from entering the Promised Land under Joshua and Moses. And we find that Joshua is fighting them. And Moses is on the hill with Aaron and Hur. And God says, you, they are going to be defeated forever because they wanted to stop my children, um, the, the family of Israel, from entering my promise. So they must be defeated. So David, God had to highlight, <laughs> hallelujah on this one, mm -hmm. God had to highlight in this event of invasion of his own camp who the real enemy was for Israel. In both cases, they said, the Philistines are the enemy of Israel. And the Amalekites are the enemies of Israel. You can fight either of them. You can never be on their side. Because where you are going to be king over Israel, you still have to fight the Amalekites. You will still have to fight the Philistines. But he had made a wrong move in the wrong time. This is transition time. He's just about to be made king. Just about to be made king. He, this is transition time. He chooses the wrong side and God had to come in and says, don't be silly. But in that don't be silly, God allows, and I call that allows, mm -hmm. the Philistines to come in and plant. Not that he sent them, but he allows that. And in God's sovereign will, David realizes who the enemy is, and now he has to get back to a godly order of inquiring of the Lord as a man after God's own heart. So here's, here's, the, here's the lesson here. The lesson is that when you're going through transition, the one thing you must always do is to inquire of the Lord. Ask God for the next move. He will speak through yourself, through your leaders, through circumstances, through his word. So in this transition that Zimbabwe is going through, many of us as saints, as the children of the body of Christ, we need to ask God what we need to do. Not for God to come in and, be, and, and just deal with things whilst we watch. We are not going to be spectators, so we need to ask God for that move. So when we pray, we must ask for the action to be taken. Prayer is not an action, it's a lifestyle. So people then say, I've prayed, so I'm just going to sit at home. 
You must pray, Pastor Kumbu, but you must ask for the action. What are you going to do? Now you've prayed, Lord, tell me about this issue we've been praying about. What is my contribution? What do I need to do? So this is what David said. They, he cried out to the Lord. And he then says, now I know we need to do something. Otherwise, we have no women and children here. So he says, should I pursue them? And will I overtake? In other words, will I defeat them? Because David wanted that confirmation before he started that. Did he ask the same thing when he was siding up the Philistines about the Israelites? No, he didn't. Now he's tuned to the Lord. He is wired to the Lord. He is connected to the Spirit of God at this time. And God says what? And he answered him and says, Pursue, for you shall surely overcome, uh, overtake them, and without fail, you will recover everything. Without fail. Then what? David goes after them. So David went. He had 600 men. This is the presidential guard. Remember, the, these 600 men, he had gone to be on the side of the Philistines. But now, these same 600 men, they now have to fight the battle of their lives because they've got to get back their wives, they've got to get back their children, and the plan that the Amalekites had taken. And, uh, and, uh, and when he came to the brook Beso, where those stayed, um, uh, where those who stayed who were left behind, but David pursued and 400 men, um, and he and 400 men, for 200 uh, stayed behind who were so weary that they could not cross the brook Beso. Now, he's got 600, 200 says we're tired. And 400 says, we will go after. Now, understand one thing. I'm talking about value of a nation and values of a nation for its citizen to adopt. Now, David has an army of 600, 200 can't fight. They're tired. I don't know what it would have been when they would have been fighting the nation of Israel on the side of the Philistines. But they're tired. But David pursues them because God has spoken. Now, one of the values of a nation is that there must be a fear of God. That person does not necessarily, by the way, be a Christian in many cases. Because people think we need a Christian to be the, the leader. But there must be a fear of God. A fear of God is actually, um, uh, the evidence of it is seen by how they honor human life. Because they realize that they are not the creator. The way they respect human life. Now, we haven't had that. In Zimbabwe, our leaders have not respected human life. People can just die. Right now, we've got the, the health system does not work. It's dysfunctional. COVID is on us. The economic collapse is on us. We have no food. People are, are hungry. But we've got a leadership that still tells people to go into their homes, stay away, don't do anything. But there is no food. There is no water. There is no medication. That is a disrespect of human life. It is a value that is abhorrable. Is that coming from the fact that we are fighting the wrong enemy? That actually, you are you are correct. We are fighting the wrong because war. we don't we have not identified the essentials between us, the values that bind us, and the, in those values we then know who is our common enemy and who is our common ally. Now, guess what begins to happen? We would have been like David fighting on the side of the Philistines to fight the nation of Israel. And that's where we are. That is the scenario I just need to paint. And God had to divert that for him to fight the real enemy. So we need to identify the real enemy so that we deal with our common problems. So our leaders, our national leaders, do not have a commonality of solving the poor man's plight in the township, in the rural areas, of not having food, of not having medication. They don't share that. Because they are sorted out. 
they don't find that as a common problem. So it's David with the nation of, or with, the, with the Philistines trying to fight the nation of Israel. That's why often you find our leaders are against the people. This is David with the, with the Philistines fighting, wanting to fight the nation of Israel and not identifying who the real common enemy is. You know, Dr. Menezes, I've always said to myself, I wonder what would have happened if Saul had actually mentored David. I mean, it's almost like God had given Israel the solutions they needed. Yep. Saul, his part to reign, but David, the, the solution for the next 20, 30 years for the nation. But because they lacked, they couldn't find each other. They ended no. up destroying each other. No, it wasn't actually they couldn't find each other. It is always the elder, the one who has power, mm. the one who has the anointing, who must nurture the next generation. So the responsibility was entirely on Saul. But he, he saw David as a threat. He saw David as a threat. Remember, David goes and camps with the Philistines who he, he was, he, he had destroyed Goliath, their right. hero. He finds refuge with the Philistines. Mm. I mean, this is a guy who had defeated in the valley of Ella. Mm. <laughs> And now he's finding refuge with them. That means there was no identity right. at that time of common values. Right. There was no identity of who the common enemies were. Mm -hmm. So if David had done that, he would be here. But let's move on. Let's move on. This is getting more interesting. I like the discussion. Mm -hmm. so, so they get there. They find an Egyptian in the field and brought him to David. And they gave him bread and he ate. And they let him drink water. And they gave him a piece of a cake of figs and two clusters of raisins. So when he had eaten, his strength came back to him, for he had eaten no bread or drunk water for three days and three nights. Then David said to him, To whom do you belong and where are you from? And he said, I am a young man from Egypt, servant of an Amalekite. And my master left me behind because three days ago I fell sick. We made an invasion of the southern area of the Cherethites in the territory which belongs to Judah and of the southern area of Caleb, and we burned Ziklag with fire. We burned Ziklag with fire. But guess what? God allows a, an informer to really tell David who the common enemy is. The Israelite, I mean the Egyptian who is a servant of the Amalekites, gives him the information that, by the way, before we came here, we had invaded Judah. Where does David come from? Judah. That's his tribe. The Amalekites, before they came to burn Ziklag, had already invaded Judah, and on the other side, Israel was waging a war with the Philistines. Who is the common enemy? Oh. So God had to correct this and say, look, now you see, these Amalekites have not just invaded you. They've just invaded your family. You were going to be fighting that side. The Amalekites were going to be fighting Israel from the other side. Whilst having taken your family and children. Um, uh, uh, and can you see what Israel would have been? Plundered on one side by the Amalekites. Plundered on the other side by the Philistines. And you would have been part of that. That's, now, we need to identify who our real enemy is. Zimbabweans have never identified who their true, 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 true enemy is. Now, in this transition that we're going through, we need to identify who our common enemy is. And we're getting there. Now, people are already are asking, so pastor, tell us who is our common mm -hmm. enemy. Now, our common enemy is never the other Zimbabwean. But our common enemy is the values that other Zimbabweans might prescribed to, which we must attack. It is the activities and the issues that divide us. 
It is those values. Because the moment I begin to say, look, the thing that you are doing is wrong. It's different from saying you are wrong. Right. Because if I say that thing you're doing is wrong, it unites us to deal with the thing that is wrong. And then we are united as a nation and as a people. Have you ever noticed that people could actually be in disagreement for a season? But in one season, they are in agreement. Why? It's because human nature realizes that we must always relate at some point. But there are issues that cause us to not relate. Once we deal with those issues, you'll be surprised how people can work together. Now, let's look at the rest of the world. Uh, East and West Germany. Are they still fighting? Germany is a united nation. One nation. The situation that happened in Rwanda. Are they still fighting? They are now one nation. So until we deal with those issues, whether they be of a legacy nature or we deal with those values, whether we have uh, um, uh, stood for the wrong values, we must deal with that. So David realizes, oh, my common enemy is not the children of Israel. Is not what they stand for. It is these Amalekites and these Philistines. So he goes and, uh, and he, he says, and then David said to him, uh, can you take me down to where the troop is? And obviously he fights them. And David uh, recovered all the Amalekites, verse 18, he had carried away. And David rescued his two wives. <laughs> he was happy. Personal issues sorted out. And nothing of theirs was lacking, either small or great, sons and daughters spoil, or anything which they had taken from them. And David recovered all. What did the Lord say? It says, Pursue, you will overtake, and you will recover all. And here it says, David recovered all. Then David took all the flocks and the heads they had driven before those other livestock and said, this is David's spoil. But here it is. They come back with the spoils of war. And this is where we probably made wrong moves. Zimbabwe gets independence. People die, sadly. People sacrifice, sadly. But we come back. We come together. We are united that we are now a free people politically. And here is what happens in the camp of David and as we finish today. Because we need to find who is the common enemy and who is the common ally. Um, so now David, verse 21, now David came to the 200 men who had been so weary that they could not follow David. Out of the 600, remember, 400 had gone and defeated, recovered everything. He comes to the brook Besor. The 200 men are still there. So they went out to meet David and to meet the people who were with him. Obviously, they would come to meet David and the people who were with him. Why? It's because their wives and children are there. There's a personal uh, issue here. This thing is very personal. They couldn't do it because they were tired or for whatever reason. Now, we've got to understand that in a transition, in a struggle, not everyone will put in at the same strength, at the same contribution as the others. But it is a value proposition that I want to bring about here. Because not everyone is going to pick up the same weight of responsibility. There are others who will do more others who would do less. Now, these who did nothing are now coming to greet David. And when David came near the people, he greeted them. And, they all, and then all the wicked and the worthless men of whom who went with David answered and said, now amongst the people who had gone with David, amongst the 400, the value system was not altogether the same. Here, the Bible says, the ones who were wicked and worthless. But they fought the war. How can you say that? These guys went to fight a war. <laughs> they recover everything. Now, but the Bible here says, amongst those 400 who fought and won, 
and brought the spoils of that war and recaptured the wives and the children and brought them back to the wives, to the, to the men who had not... They were considered here as, as, as wicked, and some of them, not all of them. Now, that is always what happens in a struggle. In a struggle, like the War of Independence, like right now, our war uh, and our struggle for emancipation, because, like I said last week, our, current, uh, the, our liberators became our oppressors. So there is a struggle that is going on. So in a struggle, you've got to understand that there is always the wicked and the worthless amongst the victors. Not everyone has got a good heart. That's also making sure we identify who is the enemy. <laughs> and here's what they say. And they said, because they did not go with us, we will not give them any of the spoil that we have recovered, except for every man's wife and children, that they may lead them away and depart. So amongst those who went to war, even the war of liberation. Let me tell you, the ones who came back, not everyone had the right heart. They were the wicked and the worthless. Happens everywhere. Happens in any group. Now, the tragedy that we have is when the wicked and the worthless now are in power. In David's situation, they were not in power. Now let's see David's response to the request of the wicked and the worthless. Here's what he says. But David said, my brethren, you shall not do so with what the Lord has given us. <laughs> I love that. Yes. I mean, as we finish up, yes. I, I just love the way David mm -hmm. just diffuses this bomb. He doesn't, because remember, David could have said, hey, who is the commander-in-chief here? It's me. And don't do what you're doing. Or he could have reacted the other way. He says, you are right, actually. We put our lives at risk. And these guys stay at the valley of Besor, or at the, the brook of Besor. And because just they were tired. Yeah, you're right. Take your wives and your children. Get out of here. You're not getting the spoils. But David transcends beyond that and he says he says this he says my brethren in fact he doesn't even address them as you wicked and worthless mm -hmm. he says my brethren because he is creating a new nation whose value system is about nationhood about unity and he's pointing to them all what is essential for them and those are the leaders we want in this transition that Zimbabwe is going through, we need leaders who are inclusive. Not partisan, but who are inclus inclusive. Because he could have attacked the wicked and the worthless, but he says, my brethren. So he brings them in. You're my friends. You want to fight the war. I hear you. And he says, you shall not do so with what the Lord has given us. Now, he says, he disarms them completely. He says, it was the Lord, because guess where the reference point for David is? He says, Lord, shall I pursue them? Will I overtake? Will I recover everything? And God says, you must pursue, you will overtake, and you will recover everything. So the glory and the victory belongs to where? To the Lord. Because David understands his value at the valley of El. He says, you come to me with a spear, a javelin, and a sword, but I come to you in the name of the Lord, whose armies you have defied. So David is now attuned to the Spirit of God. He knows where the credit uh, must go, and he gives it. So he takes the credit from even himself as a commander-in-chief. He takes the credit from these wicked and, and worthless, and he gives that whole credit to God. So he goes there. So no one has credit for this. No one can claim glory for this. Now he goes on and he says, who has preserved us? Because they could have been killed. 
um, and delivered us into our hand, the troop that came against us. For who will heed you in this matter? But as his part is who goes down to battle, so shall his part be who stays by the supplies that they shall share alike. So it was that day forward he made it a statute and an ordinance for Israel to this day. I want to finish off. So David takes away the entitlement of those who went to fight. Zimbabwe did not take away the entitlement of those who went to fight the war of liberation. David gives the credit to God Almighty because he had saved them because others would have died. Zimbabweans did not give the credit for winning the war of liberation to God, but they gave it to an occult system. And David says, we will share the spoils equally with those who went to war and those who didn't go to war. Zimbabwe did not share the spoils of, 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 uh, of, of the blessings of Zimbabwe. And where we are today is because others felt that they needed to get more than others. There are people who still don't benefit from the wealth of Zimbabwe today because it was not shared equally. It was not shared uh, liberally to everybody. And just a few. But David said that we shall share. We shall. Uh, uh, the, his, and his part B stays by the supplies. They shall share alike. So it was from that day forward that Israel, whenever it went to war, and there were spoils of war, it shared with the people who went to war and the people who didn't go to war. It says, the Bible says, up until this day, it was a national value. It was a national value that Israel, whatever it won, to this day, you look at the success of Israel, the nation of Israel today, it's all for one, and one for all to this day. A nation of seven million people. It is a superpower today. It is in a desert. Its agriculture is top of the range. Technology wise, it's ahead of the pack. In medicine, it's ahead of the pack. This is a nation that has learned to do one value that whatever you get, we share accordingly together. This is a nation that understands that. Do we have the same in Zimbabwe? Pastor PK. Oh. Well, Doc, as we close, I want to maybe end, for us to end with a prophetic note uh, as we speak to the nation. You know, in Ezekiel 37, you know, the Valley of Dry Bones. Mm -hmm. That prophetic word was to bring, it was really unity. And that picture was how do you bring unity to a nation? And as you read Ezekiel 37, we always end in verse 15, but... At the end of that chapter, it talks of the spirit of David. And people don't realize that. That, that Ezekiel 37 chapter ends with the Davidic mantle that unites the nation. And mm. today, you've taken us on a journey where we've looked at, we must know our enemies. And that you are not my enemy. Or mm. group B is not my enemy. Or group A is not my enemy. But the enemy is a system. The enemy is a mindset. The enemy are these wrong values that have mm. destroyed our nation. Mm. And I want us as we end to really pray for our nation that we would unite the tribes. And that as the tribes or the, the and the tribes, I'm speaking of the groups, the, mm. the groups at an individual, that at an individual level, at a family level, at a political level, mm. that our nation indeed would be one under David, under a Davidic value system. Amen. We would do that uh, next week. We will handle the next piece, mm. how a state is formed through its military and how David actually brings a value system through the way he brings together the, what I would term as the presidential guard. Those 600 people, those 600 men, form the presidential guard. And next week we'll talk about how that army's values were set. Because today we've seen how David sets a national value before he gets into office, of defining who the enemy is, who the ally is, and how do we share in the national treasure. 
So that's what we do. God bless you. Well, you've had God's word today. I'd like to close by just sharing the fact that if you want to be a part of this Davidic kingdom, it can only happen when you accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal savior. The Bible commands me as a man of God to command you that you need Jesus Christ in your life. All men have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. So how can you receive this free gift? Well, the Bible says if you will confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, and if you believe in your heart, you will be saved. And I want to invite you into a relationship with the King of Kings, for we just don't want our politicians saved. We want every citizen, we want every citizen to align to this Davidic model. And you can only do that when the Lord Jesus Christ is Lord of your life. So let's, let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I come before you today. I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I've not lived my life in a way that gives honor and glory to you. But I come to you today and I ask you to be Lord on my li of my life. I accept you, Lord Jesus, as my Lord and my King in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you for accepting the Lord Jesus Christ. I look forward to seeing you next week as we continue with Dr. Shinga Muneza on this journey of building the right citizen that understands the Davidic model of kingdom leadership. God bless you. We've come to the end of our service, and once again, we'd like to thank you for your company. We hope that uh, you have benefited from the many ideas shared this very evening from Dr. Muneza. It's worth remembering as we go to our separate homes and our vocations and begin a new week. Ladies and gentlemen, if you wish to plant for days, plant flowers, the proverb says. If you want to plant for years, plant trees. And if you want to plant for a lifetime, plant ideas. Our hope is that you've gained more ideas that will carry you through not only this time, but for the rest of your life. Have a great week ahead.